My name is Mia Nielsen. I'm the director of the show, and I am truly honored to uh, introduce our panel and to welcome this special conversation, uh, which is hosted by RBC, our principal sponsor. Uh, we have Corey Jackson, senior curator of RBC, who will be moderating this conversation. I also welcome Jean-Francois Bellil, the director of the National Gallery of Canada. Um, Emily Changer, director and curator of The Agnes, as well as Stefan Yost. Uh, Michael and Sonia Kerner, director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Mia. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today and, and taking the time to listen in on the conversation. It's going to be... I think a, a pretty open dialogue on the topic of collecting the work of our time, as the title suggests. I feel very lucky to be in the presence of, of three people who are on the go so constantly and in movement and seen so much. And I am feeling very stationary by comparison right now. <laughs> so um, I think uh, my pace might be a little bit slower. I'm going to listen in and let uh, our wonderful panelists uh, discuss their approaches which um, to collecting and institution building, which I think have really, across the NGC, Agnes and the AGO, set a tone for what collecting means nationally to uh, the collectors who are here today, who are looking at work, but also to artists and leading other institutions. Um, just to give some context why I think at RBC we wanted to bring this conversation into our Toronto. RBC is a collecting institution. We've been acquiring work since 1929. We are very different from a lot of collecting institutions. We acquire work and put art in spaces where people aren't necessarily making the conscious effort to go and engage with work. And that's very different than institutional collecting. That's very different than putting work into a private space. It's very different than what a lot of people are doing here today, thinking about the role of art in their personal spaces. So I wanted to take some time, because the work that the institutions that are here um, and a part of this discussion are doing really influence how we at RBC acquire work thinking about broader conversations, not necessarily individual ones when we acquire. What are the conversations that are happening in these public spaces where people are making the conscious effort to participate and engage? And what's the impact on artists as well? Um, I don't think a lot of artists necessarily make work, and the need to make work exists. And then there's that other piece of then, who is your audience, and where does that live, and where do those conversations happen? And that's where collecting enters into that dialogue. Um, so I guess off the bat, you know, that intersection of where collecting starts, for me, the first time I became really aware of it, I was working as a studio assistant for an artist, and they had a, a bit of a divided practice. They had work that they would make that they felt was commercial, and then they had work that they felt was institutional. And there was a bit of a divide. And I don't think that's the case with every artist at all, um, but it was a way that they could figure out how to support their practice in the most meaningful way to them. And I guess just maybe to start off, I'm curious from each of our panelists, we'll start with Jean-Claude Francois because you're right here. Um, the introduction to this idea of supporting collecting for me, that was my first experience of seeing how collecting could support an artist. But you've also had a long individual trajectory working with artists directly. If our panelists can maybe speak quickly, because <laughs> I have lots of questions. But just to your initial relationship to the idea of collecting, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Really happy to be here. Um, and this is the, uh, I think it's the first public talk that I do since I've started at the National Gallery. Uh, so. It's, it, it's exciting, but I obviously don't know as much about our collection at the National Gallery as, as I will in a few months or a few years. Um, 
but I think there, there are a couple of things in what you just said that I'd like to, to, to start with. Um, the, the, the idea of collecting for an institution versus a private individual, there's one aspect that is, I think, fundamentally different, is this idea that we are also collecting to write and record history and to preserve things. So we relate to the objects differently. Even if they don't go on the walls right away, if they go in the vaults, the idea is to there is a, there will be in between all the three of us, but every single institution across the country, um, this idea that we are writing or recording Canadian art history. So what will what is in there? What is in the vaults that we will be able to look at in 100 years or 200 years? So that's a big uh, something that really fascinates me and that puts a lot of weight, I think, on institutions of like you can't get this wrong. Like you, you don't want to be sidetracked uh, on a on the wrong path of history, or hopefully, um, not that they're necessarily right and wrong paths, there are multiple paths, but th there's something there that is a, a bit peculiar about institutions. We can talk about retroactive collecting later. <laughs> exactly, well, and that's, that's part of it, right? Um, and you were talking about commercial versus non-commercial or institutional. I, as you say, I think that, that, that line has really uh, melted over time, but at the very base of that line is this idea that there are works that are just too big to go into homes or offices or too complex or too uh, difficult to maintain or manage. Um, and the institutions have the means to work with those works, uh, which I think is fantastic. And that's really important. You talk about supporting artists and working with artists, um, artists that want to create those works. Um, uh, institutional collections are, are primordial in making them happen and, and safe keeping them to, to in Canadian art history. Um, so I think there's these different facets of how an institution collects is really interesting. And in my case, so the National Gallery, of course, we do all that. We did it before in Juliet as well, um, at the Arsenal before that. And I was, I was uh, heavily involved in the commercial world, you know, running a, an art galleries association, so working just on the commercial side, quote, unquote. Um, so I feel like I've experienced sort of both, all, all different stages of that spectrum, um, which is really, really fascinating to me. It, it really is an ecology in, in many ways. The commercial side is, is not so separate from the institution. I think even if walking through our Toronto, you see the power plant here. You see um, artist-run centers. And that interaction, I know for me, when we're looking at emerging artists, some of the first places that we look to on an artist's CV is, oh, well, have they had that initial emerging artist support by their peers and through artist-run centers? And that's kind of like a a vote of confidence from peers. That means a lot. Um, Emily, I guess continuing the question to you, I feel like I've, through your career, you've worked within institutional spaces that also are tied to education, engagement. You've done and facilitated a lot of artist commissions. Can you speak a little bit about the process of how collection came into, like what was your first moment of bringing that into your curatorial approach? Um, thanks, hey everyone. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I think I'll start by saying I really never intended to be the director of a museum um, at all. Um, I'm a, an artist and contemporary art curator known for collaborating with artists to produce new works for the world, not with an eye for collecting, and so much of the commissions I've done have been ephemeral. Um, and also known for um, the sort of active transformation of the institution from within by putting pressure on its systems and protocols through a practice I call inReach. Nevertheless, in 2020, I sort of um, felt that it was like no longer enough to bring a practice to an institution to transform it from within. Um, I um, thought the institution itself had to become a practice. And so this was my transition to becoming a director. And I chose Agnes uh, Etherington Art Center because I think it's a very special uh, institution. Like when I arrived, I said, you know, it has all the trappings of a museum. It's got a 17,000 object collection, um, but it's a university gallery, so it's nimble enough to change. Um, and I thought, you know, going to a place like Kingston, the first capital of Canada, um, with an opportunity to build a new building. I, of course, wasn't interested in building a new museum. I was interested in rebuilding museological practice from the ground up. And Agnes is very special to me in this regard as I enter this phase, I suppose, of my career, 
um, because of its collections, because it holds 17,000 objects across all time periods and worldviews, I thought it's one of the most special places to be able to work with his we we'll work with the idea of history in a contemporary way. And so this is, I think, my moment of working with collections um, at the same time as being very mindful um, that these kinds of collecting practices must also change through the transformation of the institution. So this is, I mean, you've just started and you're like, oh, to talk about this place that I'm in. I've been at the Agnes for three years. Um, and have spent my time on the infrastructural transformation of our practices and protocols in order to shape the future of collecting at that institution. Thanks so much, Emily. And Stefan, I, I think you also bring an interesting perspective to this as you're also coming from outside of Canada. And when I think about the um, collecting network within Canada, I sometimes it feels quite unique. Um, can you speak a little bit about your background and your introduction sure. to collecting? Uh, I guess seven years in, I, I, I become a Canadian, I think, next week. So Oh, welcome. Uh, there we go. Um, so, yeah, um, that'll be the passport number three. So whenever people ask, hey, where are you from? I'm always like, uh, that's a little complicated sometimes. But um, being at the AGO has been an incredible privilege. And there is that ecosystem question. Um, and first of all, the, we started this conversation about collecting. And, and one of the real luxuries of the private collector is you can make this deeply personal. Right? It can be simply because you love it. It can be intellectual. It can be, you know, it can be social. There's lots of reasons, but you're accountable to yourself, right? Which is, which is great. And unbelievable museums are usually this formation, this, this merging of private collectors, collections, right? You look at the Zacks collection or the Thompson collections, plus collections that are formed by um, curators. And we've got 12 amazing curators who have quite a bit of independence, kind of. So what we do is we say, okay, there's an overall strategy. It's really simple. Our strat first is buy the best thing that you can. Quality, I might be conservative there, but quality counts. Some works are better than other works. Some artists are, you know, uh, certain artists are way better than other artists. It's not popular to say, but like, I'm not a great artist. Sonia Boyce is a better artist than me, got it. Um, the second thing we do is we form relationships with collectors or artists to get collections of collections. So 500 Diane Arbuses, that's a big move, right? That changes art history, not in a little kind of filling in a gap kind of way. That's like saying, we're going in, we believe. Um, the other is in diversifying this question about, um, and there we've gotten quite specific. It's uh, African diaspora artists, indigenous artists globally, contemporary Asian, and women artists, right? So sometimes it's temptation to say, hey, we're gonna diversify our collections, we're gonna do everything by everybody, and it actually doesn't change it. So for the last five years, that's what we've been focusing on. We reevaluate roughly every five years, say, how do we tweak it? And the last is deaccessioning, and deaccessioning funds the strategy. So we do sell, um, we sell from the bottom up, we sell things that aren't high enough quality, and we do it publicly and transparently. That's, that's kind of what we do. Thanks for getting in, into that. I think that leads into the, the next question that I wanted to, to go to to the panel as well and that I think will be useful. There is something about the idea of the institutional collecting that, that feels quite opaque. We know there's brilliant curators who are driving exhibition making and putting what we see when we go into a museum, um, making that accessible for us as audiences. But with a collection, there is this piece of what's been there before, what are we collecting that we were then going to care for in perpetuity. Um, it, you spoke really briefly, or for the moment there, about the curators that you rely on. I'm wondering, Emily, um, maybe we'll start with you, but when you're looking into the idea of an acquisition, can you speak a little bit about the process? Because I think every institution has a slightly unique take on what that looks like and just to bring a little bit of transparency into how long those conversations can take and um, what the steps are along the way and then we'll go to you Jean-Francois to continue that. 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> we at Agnes now, I mean, I doubled, more than doubled the curatorial staff when I arrived um, and created two new, three new curatorial positions, curator of academic outreach and community engagement, curator care and relations, and curator arts of Africa to complement the uh, curator of European art, curator of Canadian historical, um, and curator of contemporary art. And... Um, uh, I think in the past it was very much <clears throat> individual curators bringing works in their various areas to um, to the table for acquisition, and it passed quite seamlessly and easily like that. Um, and now we work through a consensus model. Um, it's difficult and it's process-based and it takes a long time, but it's not a long time around the discussions of... Um, <clears throat> the holdings per se, but the agreement among the curatorial staff who have been de-siloed. So we don't have these areas of specialization anymore. We work, uh, all of us work with contemporary art and all of us work toward the entanglement of our collections holdings because Agnes, I don't know, for those who don't know, we have, you know, a really stellar, uh, 16th century Dutch Baroque collection, including Rembrandt's, uh, and a historical African collection on Haudenosaunee territory. And we understand that these histories are already entangled. So our ways of working through consensus as a curatorial team in relationship to the idea of taking up history in new ways uh, through this consensus model is uh, not is to resist these, these impulses to categorize and separate and perpetuate colonial ways of thinking within our, our um, uh, acquisitions practices. Um, but we also, and so we decide as a team, um, there has been some stellar contemporary works that have come through by artists who are actively being acquired at institutions and, you know, it will come up that there, it feels that this uh, work is culturally appropriative and it does not get past the internal conversation at the institution. Um, and sometimes those are heartbreaking things that happen, but we actually stick to our guns and we do work through consensus because the idea is that we are actively con uh, acquiring contemporary art. We're not necessarily actively acquiring historical African art. Um, but we understand what our holdings are, the entanglements of these histories, so that we are acquiring contemporary works that ensure that historical works still have futurities in our, in our world. Um, and we have this sort of idea that historical works are futurities and contemporary works are prototypes. Um, and then we also now have a very active commissioning program because we are gearing up for a live-in artist residency and we are working collaboratively with artists um, and over the last couple of years truly with artists who are also participating in the active transformation of Agnes um, and working toward commissions that speak uh, to the collections the same way the curators are complexifying the histories there. So the artists are at the very heart of Agnes helping to shape the stories we want to tell uh, for Agnes's future. And then we do have an external acquisitions committee that we take our uh, list of acquisitions to uh, on a sort of um, like three times a year. Right now we have a moratorium on collecting because we are packing our 17,000 object collection moving off site to build a new building. But um, this does happen regularly and we acquire through purchase um, but also donations and bequests. But I will say that the donations and bequests and we just I accepted a bequest. We're closing a lot of um, chapters at Agnes right now but we had this pretty incredible bequest uh, Joyce Putnam, who's a local Kingstonian who had a collection of these A.Y. Jacksons. And, you know, we're like constantly like saying, why <laughs> at this time? Because, of course, our purchases have gone to QT BIPOC artists. Uh, all money uh, over the last few years have. But it was these A.Y. Jacksons were produced with the support of this collector in her home. And there was a portrait of her and there was a sensibility for us that was very much like Agnes Etherington who supported Andre Beeler who, and the, together they came up with the Agnes Etherington Art Center as he was a, 
artist in residence in her home. So there was something very special about this bequest that we went with because it spoke to the kinds of hospitable origins and support, direct support of artist production that we hold dear to us as an institution. That's a really beautiful example of, of private collecting and intersecting with the institution as well. Thank you. And, and I want to pick up on a few things that you just said that you, you're so we, we really, an institution collecting can't be everything to everyone at all, all the time. So these tough choices that you're talking about have to be made and, and um, a bit like any private collecting as well, right? The budget is never infinite, so you have to, at one point or another, you have to decide it's this one or that one. Um, and in our cases, it's budget, but it's also resources, it's also people. You had spoken about time. You know, an acquisition process in a museum, if it's a, if it's a donation, can, can take up to a year. Uh, an acquisition is a bit shorter, but it's still really long because of internal committees, external committees, board approval, and all that. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very lengthy process, and a, very quickly the schedule is full, and you're like, shit, we can't do anything more this year. And they have to push it on to next year, and it, it becomes complicated. And then when you start ch making these choices, these decisions, I think one of the really important aspects, at least for us, um, but I think all institutions, is making these choices in full of awareness, full of awareness of your blind spots or your biases of like, what am I doing? If I'm dropping something, what is the impact of that? And that's what you were saying about the group of seven, right? Like if we, so if, if, you, if we say yes to one and no to the other, what will happen? What will be the consequence in five years, 10 years when you look at everything that was acquired in 2023 or 2024? And they're, they're really impactful decisions. Um, and sometimes they just happen in the, in the rush of the moment because like this is happening and we have to deal with this. Uh, sometimes they're influenced by your procedures and your policies and the biases are running much deeper. And we gotta f take the time to, to look at those biases and, and make sure that we try to iron out as many of them as possible. Um, realizing that as we do that, we'll probably create new biases that someone else will deal with in 10 years. Um, but it, I mean, that's the, the sort of and the nature. And for us, it was like that particular work was made in Kingston. And that's what, what its affinity to why Agnes would do this at this time, at this moment. Which is, which is a great reason. Um, and and it's, it's also, and that maybe points back to one other thing that you were saying about like, how does that process work? Like, what is that black box? And that black box is really packed of stuff. And sometimes it's information that we only know, unless you're sitting here talking with people and letting, sharing that information, someone could walk into the gallery and not know why this work was acquired in that year. Um, and, and get the wrong idea on it or the right idea or whatever it is. Um, and so sharing information about that process, like one of them is, you know, it might be an amazing work from 1972 or 2012 or whenever it was, but do we already have a work that does that by the artist in the collection? And if so, do we want to double up when we have limited time and limited budgets? Probably not. So you know, I'll take extra Van Goghs if anybody has one. <laughs> Okay, send your fingers to the AGO. It's interesting you're talking about these processes and procedures. We get, they get written into what an institution is and its goals and its mandates. But I think I've also seen all of your institutions in different ways push the parameters of what those guidelines are in different ways. I'm thinking about ideas of joint acquisitions, crowdfunding, bringing in public conversations into acquisitions. Um, Stefan, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about Kusama coming into the yeah. collection. I mean, one of the things that, yes, all of our institutions are going under significant change. Um, I would say the biggest change by far at the AGO is our audience, right? So about 60%, 60% of our audience is of non-European heritage and 52% of our visitors are in their 30s or younger, not including school kids, okay? So that's just is. Go there, that is. That didn't happen by mistake, right? That, that, um, but it changes how you think about who your audience is, right? Our, our audience is super young, super young, engaged, global, very diverse. So we serve our audience, right? So that's the first thing. We did do something um, several years ago where we purchased, we had a big Kusama show. One of the things we tried to do is when we do a show, we try to buy a work out of it, right? Otherwise you're like, hey, I had that great Jackson Pollock show in 1972 and there's no record of it, right? So we, we try to, um, but it's a sign of commitment to the artists too and whether that's a well-known artist like Kusama or less well-known. 
So we purchased the Kusama work. It's an infinity mirror room, 1.5 oh, million, right? Um, and we crowdsourced it. So just over 4,000 people, mostly in Ontario, gave anywhere from 20,000 bucks to 50 bucks. Um, and so it was a, it's kind of like now people will go and will say, hey, I helped the AGO buy that. The lawn, it's literally on a video screen, the, the thank yous. But I do want to say that that was done in the 1950s for a Tintoretto. Right, that you could buy 10, 10, 10 bucks. So this idea of community involvement in acquisitions isn't new. I simply ripped off an idea from 1950 and it worked really well. We do do joint acquisitions. Lisa Rayana, some of you might have seen this huge wallpaper piece that describes kind of Micronesia, Melanesia. We co it was a half a million euros. That's a lot, a lot of money for us. So we co-purchased that with the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. So, and it's a data file, that's what it actually is. So, so there's lots of kind of creative ways to to get there, because we don't actually have huge acquisition money, so we have to partner with collectors, with companies, with individuals, et cetera. And there's also the idea, I, I love, personally love joint acquisitions, because um, a lot of our works, you gotta face it. I mean, they, they go in a vault and they sleep for 90% of the time. So <laughs> could we not like do this in between museums where they sleep 80% or 70% of the time instead of 90%, um, which would be great for everyone? We show just over 2% of what we own. The collections, which wrote. is an international average. Yeah, the international average is 2.1 percent, if I remember go. well. Yeah, it's not the. In the last seven years, we've acquired over 20,000 works. Right, so the collection is growing at a terrifying rate. It's a lot of work, um, but that's. And then we run out of space as well. This is, is where working with a corporate collection helps. 90 percent of our pieces are on the walls, <laughs> so it's a little bit Jealous. of a different flip. We get things seen pretty regularly. Um, Emily, I, on, the, on the idea of joint acquisitions as well, I feel like that's a, something that I've seen you partake in pretty regularly. Yeah, I mean, I think there's other reasons for joint acquisitions. I mean, money, of course, but um, I mean, a great example, and I actually want to thank the NGC for not acquiring Barbara Wagner and Benjamin de Burka's rise. Uh, because uh, Barbara uh, Wagner and Benjamin de Bricker are two amazing artists from the northeast of Brazil, and I commissioned a film of theirs in 2018 with spoken word poets and rappers and dancers and singers in, from Scarborough and Jane Finch. And, I mean, it, they represented uh, Brazil at the Venice Biennial, and that's all the, the NGC folks there. And I was like, oh, that's awesome for Barbara and Benjamin. And then, it did, and then I thought to myself, oh, it'd probably be awesome for the AGYU where I worked at that time and who commissioned it. Um, so I did have this opportunity, but we co-purchased it. Um, so the Art Gallery of York University, where I worked for 17 years before going to uh, Agnes, uh, co-purchased it with the Doris McCarthy Gallery in Scarborough. So this co-purchase actually returned the work to the communities from which it derived, but also enacted, like, the principles of the project, which was to build solidarity between these two suburbs uh, in Toronto uh, in, in perpetuity through the piece, but to create the situation where the AGYU and the Doris McCarthy, like the poets and rappers, would always have to be together. And um, I think that, was, and the other thing that that co-acquisition allowed us to do, because uh, we pulled resources, was to convince Barbara and Benjamin's dealer to um, waive their percentage and give it back to the community members in Jane Finch and Scarborough. Um, but we could do that because we could afford that purchase, you know. Um, and Barbara and Benjamin make work in collaboration with communities, so I think that's a whole other thing to think about when you're acquiring artists' work who work in a socially engaged manner with communities and that money and royalties don't go back to the communities themselves something we're thinking a lot about at Agnes. Um, but on the community engagement front of like collections and finding ways to show the collections more, I mean, we have a historical dress collection <laughs> at Agnes. Some of it's very fragile. Um, we've done two things recently that really like foregrounds this collection in ways that allow it to be shown, but not shown in a traditional way. And one was to commission um, no, I am going through menopause, everybody. Uh, Jesus. Karen Jones, the most amazing artist from Vancouver, uh, to create a piece called Freed, and it was in response to one of the historical dress collection, pieces in the historical dress collection, 
through this exhibition called History is Rarely Black or White that was curated by the fantastic Jason Cyrus. All oh, my names are coming back to me, thank God. Um, and it, this exhibition looked at the history of this collection, the cotton, through um, but with art conservation analysis tracing the origins of the cotton and dyes connecting to the transatlantic slave trade. And so Karen made this beautiful piece of hair and cotton that is that surrounded one of the dresses in this collection. And the acquisition of that work made sure, A, Jason's research persisted. So we can never look at this dress again without looking at where the cotton and dyes came from. But the condition of Karen's, uh, the condition of the acquisition, we did this through purchase, was that it would always be shown with that dress. So if anybody borrows the Karen Jones, just so you know, from the Agnes, you also must show this dress and show this re these entangled relationships. And right now we're repatterning the dress collection with drag queens in Kingston making um, patterns for all bodies and making these dresses uh, open source. So anybody can recreate them because we have this feeling at Agnes too that when, they, when dresses, or we have a decorative arts collection too, or spoon, sit in the vaults, they're dead. And we are learning a lot from the ancestors and cultural belongings in our care that these are living uh, entities that hold knowledge and teach, and all artworks can do that, but we have to set them free. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Um, the note I will say, just because that we are in an art fair right now, is, is, is not to negotiate with all gallerists to drop their fees, because I don't know if that will go over so well. And also, artists often are subject to those negotiated rates as well. So don't take the money away from the gallerists or artists back to other here artists. advocating, <laughs> unless the money is going back to other artists. Um, I have one last question, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, thinking about those who are walking through the fair today and thinking about collecting or who have established collecting collections and are looking to collect in depth, who are thinking about where those collections may end up, thinking about institutional donations, perhaps one day. Um, do you have any recommendations in like a sentence or two for how an individual collector who wants to live with work but understands the, the institution's value can kind of collapse those two together? So I think there's three parts to this. Is first of all, do form meaningful relationships with gallerists. They are super knowledgeable. Do get to know artists or if you're studying historical, collecting historical thing, go deep, right? But, but those relationships are key. Don't turn it into a transaction, turn it into a relationship. So go back to the same dealer who matches your taste, support them, support those artists. That's the first thing. Uh, get involved with museums. We have six acquisitions committees. They, um, anybody can join them, right, pretty much. You just kinda, and that you can match with your taste. Get to know curators, form long-term relationships. Nobody makes transformative gifts if they've known you for two years. It's after 20 years that they, they, they do that, right? It's, that's just the timeline. And the third thing is um, talk to your accountant. Uh, Canadian tax law, CPERB, if you, if you collect quality, you have a huge possible upside from taxes. The federal government, the Canadian Cultural Property Export Review Board, it has to be significant works of art. That's why there's a real reason for you to buy quality. Because if, if we think it's nationally significant, it transforms your tax relationship with that gift. So those are several things. And, and all other countries around the world are extremely jealous of the fiscal setup that we have in Canada for tax donations. So you should really inquire about that. I think that the, the, the fourth thing that I would add is that there's, there's this, this uh, concept, at least in all the galleries where I worked, where even when we purchase or acquire or through a donation or work of art, we don't really own it. The community owns it. We're just the caretakers. And you as individuals, when, even when you buy it, if you're, if you're thinking, if this is not like something that you just want to decorate your office with and in three years you don't care what happens with it. If you want to pass it on to a museum, if you want to work with a, with a gallery, um, you don't really own it either, really sorry, but you're only taking care of it for a few years. So take really good care of it because we often get donations, offers that they're fantastic, but they're in really bad state. 
and museums don't have the money or the time to restore them. Like there's a backlog of hundreds and hundreds of pieces that we know should, would need restoration before we ever get to show them again. Um, and I got to the point now, and I don't know about you guys, but I got to the point where we just can't acquire those damaged works anymore. We can't just add stuff to the backlog of things that need to be restored to be, to, to, so that we can show them. Um, so we're going to have to say no to those donations because there's just not the, it's not going to get better over time. It's only going to get worse. Um, so take really good care of the art. There's some really, really simple rules to follow. Um, but I think it's a form of respect for the art and the artist as well um, that we definitely believe in uh, in the, the, the museum world. UV glass. Invest in UV glass. <laughs> take care of the works. Emily, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I think it was a really robust answer, but I mean, I think the relationship is key, and I think um, understanding, I mean, it can be subjective, many things are autobiographical, including how you run an institution or how you curate, um, but investing in why you want, what the futurity of this work is, why you're interested in what this artist is pushing at, what, what, what brought you to that work, and then ensure that you have an idea about that. And if you're going to, if you have an idea that you want to gift this to a museum, along with that should come a cash gift to keep that engagement alive because it, showing the work and engaging with the work and finding new ways to present it or repattern it <laughs> is how the, how the collections stay alive, but also how the artist's ideas stay circulating and relevant. And museums don't always have the resources to keep, to do that in perpetuity. And I think by working uh, closely and building those relationships, you can have really transformative museum practices that come alongside major donations. Thanks, Emily. I think that what you were speaking to around having that relationship to the intent of the artist is really what the value is that we all get in living with art if we have the opportunity and um, to be able to, to hold that really precious. I'd like to open it up to the audience. We have about a few minutes if there's any questions. There's a mic coming to you. Hello. Hi, my name is Leo. I'm an artist here in Toronto. And I have a question about future futurity and about the past. We talked a little bit about really long spans of time. We talked about keeping art alive. We talked about building and maintaining relationships. Um, how do you see yourselves, uh, how do you see your relationships and responsibilities to artists, audience members, or society at large who are no longer alive or who are not alive yet, when we think about those long spans of time? And that's a, uh, it's a really good question. So what's our responsibility to the community and artists and before, during, and after? And oftentimes, I feel like we're so close to it. Sorry? We covered that. Sorry? Uh, not, not, during. not during. OK, before and after. Responsibility to audience that has been and has yet to that be. That will be. And I often feel like we're, we're, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like we're so close to it that it's, it's a tough one to answer. Uh, that there's like we, you don't have the, the the privilege of like looking back 200 years after. Uh, so how is that going to age? How people are going to respond to it? And you were, Stefan, you were talking about the the, and it's related to that. I think you were talking about the fact that your diversity, the, the diversity of your your people coming through the museum is is um, 60 percent or something like that. Um, that's great. But do you? And it's really interesting. And I don't have an answer. I'm not judging. But who do we buy for? For that 60 percent in the gallery now, or for the people? in, you know, after this artist has gone through? Um, I don't have an answer. It's a great question. Um, the reality is, is most of the Art Gallery of Ontario is actually pretty fixed. We've got the Thompson Canadian, amazing things. And we're actually expanding significantly. We break ground in April on 40,000 square feet. So that's roughly the size of the Whitney, um, just for modern and contemporary art with no restriction. Right? Because what we need to do is, as our audience changes, what we show and how we show it needs to change. Right? There is a, just a, a, the number one document we should look at is the census. Who lives here? Who's the community we're serving? But also looking forward a bit. 
it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that it's already starting, but really in 10 to 30 years from now, there will be significant immigration from sub-Saharan Africa. What Julie Crooks and her team are doing is actually starting to buy and think about that. Because ultimately, to create social cohesion, we need to make sure when people come into the AGO, they see themselves or they see their multiple histories, right? So that's one of the things we're trying to figure out because that takes 20 years to build a really strong collection that is the African diaspora. That's just one example because we know the audience will change in the future just on immigration patterns. These are massive moves and we've always been 20 years late. What would happen if we tried to project and be 20 years forward? I think your question's excellent. Uh, I'd, I'd like to talk to this because I think that we have an incredible opportunity to change the social imaginary. I'm always thinking of the future. Um, and I'm also very, and thinking seven generations before and seven generations after, and thinking about the incommensurability of the institutions of art and their architectures to actually um, live in a, a future. And so one of my big projects is actually to change the architectures of the Agnes so that we are creating the appropriate spaces for care, ceremony, feeding, touching, dancing of ancestors and cultural belongings that are they're actually not in our collection. It's, we inherited it from Queen's transfer collection, um, which is the consequence of ethnographers and anthropologists traveling the world, and then, boom, the university gallery ends up with these riches. And we take very seriously our custodianship and stewardship through process of repatriation, but they, they never asked to be in this, these institutions. Um, in, in so many narratives, they're unknown artists, but they, these individuals were certainly known to their community. Um, so how do we respectfully go through this process of engaging community around belongings and ancestors? Um, and that's an, uh, that will be an ongoing process Agnes is gonna have to do for the rest of Agnes's <laughs> existence. And this is bridging these past, present, future temporalities and kind of uh, mixing them. And these ancestors and cultural belongings don't belong. In, it's a Western artifact of the past to think that they belong incarcerated in Western art museum vaults. Um, so I'm thinking of like, how do you build for the future um, that hasn't yet happened but must? which is a Tina M. Camp quote, just so you know. Just a little and there's, there's something there. really exciting about this idea that I think there seems to be a consensus that we need to ask ourselves those questions, and that it's not a one-off. Like, we will need to keep on asking ourselves these questions for forever. And there's something really exciting in there, I think. I think there's a, there's a, it's a very positive uh, step for the future, I think. I, I know, I'm like, sorry, Winsome, but I have to say something about your work, too, because uh, so when I think about the futurities, um, you know, I look at Agnes's uh, as an incredible collection, but you know, when I arrived in Kingston, I was sort of experiencing like this really great young group of racialized girls called Roots and Wings and seeing all this history of like diasporic activity going on in Kingston. And then, you know, I'm like, Winsome Winsome has a 26 year history in Kingston. Why don't we have Winsome Winsome's work in our collection? And so we work with Pamela Matharu to create this like historical connection and uh, acquire Winsome Winsome's work to catch up with Kingston's change. I just had a statement. Um, <laughs> Pass the mic to Winston Winston. <laughs> I just had a statement. Um, the AGO person said that 60%, that they're now looking at the future, who the people will be. But 90, in 1990, 1999, it was, there was no looking at the future. There were a completely, you didn't see one, I was the only black person when I went into the gallery to view shows that I saw, I didn't see other black people. They may have a few occasionally blacks from the state working there, but none of Canadian. Actually, I was the first black Canadian to show at the HEO, and that was only in 1999. I think the first 
living show of a woman artist was in 1987, I want to say. Canadian. I know. No, I'm just saying there's lots of blind spots here. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's pretty Canadian, rough. Canadian yeah. black. I'm yeah. talking. They yeah. had uh, American blacks and stuff. And I'm wondering, why, but you're now saying that they're looking to the future. And I hope it's true that we'll see lots and lots. And I've been recently yeah. been seeing a lot. Yeah. A lot of people that I've mentored, I've seen going through there. So that's great, you know. Um, and I just wanted to say to you, Emily, of what you're doing there, of paying attention to the ancestors, Agnes, is very, very important because I know they're crying. My work is very spiritual and, and political. So for me, seeing all what you're doing with the ancestors and all that celebration you did of the African, of the work, African collection, made me so happy. It was most peaceful I've slept in a long time. My question is to all three of you, are you gonna return the work to the countries that were taken out without the people, without knowledge or wars and they just took out, I know a lot of the ones at Queens were taken out during war period with the countries not even knowing that they were being taken out. I, have, I think they should be returned, but I also have a problem with that because those countries do not, a lot of them do not know how to protect them. I think of Mali, where a lot of the books and stuff are being destroyed. So would you maybe, when returning them, put money into upkeeping them in these countries? The, you've opened up the conversation of restitution, which is, by the way, one of the most interesting and complex um, things. Um, I've had five or six restitution cases during my career where things have been returned. Um, and uh, it's really interesting. And often you're, you're trying to figure out the difference between a legal system and then that question of what is the ethical choices and what's right, right? So there's, so in each, you have to look at each case individually. Um, and I think my starting point is I don't believe that it's in the mission of the AGO to own stolen art. We'll start there. And then we can kind of negotiate from there, right? But I, I just don't think that's part of what we should be doing. What is stolen, we can have that conversation. But it's super interesting. But I think that's the only ethical starting point is not in my mission to own stolen art. Let's talk about that. And, and I think it's the same, uh, same perspective here. Uh, I, I think it's one of the biggest questions of the next couple of decades. Um, it's huge. And, and museums, Canadian museums, are, are doing a lot of work and spending a lot of time thinking about this and talking to the government about this. Um, you know, the, the Canadian Museum Association has, did a quick study, and there are 7 million pieces in Canada that should be restituted to other countries, to other communities, whatever, wherever it is. That's huge. What I'm worried about at the moment is, and, and you can imagine the costs, like we're not talking about a plane ticket here, we're talking about, it's astronomical. Um, so of course that makes politicians very careful when they, 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 they approach those questions. What I'm worried about is that we're in a position now where as each museum thinks about this, we try to invent solutions and look at them one case at a time. That's seven million different stories being written. And a lot of them, I would say the majority of them, will commit mistakes along the way. That's a lot of mistakes. And I think it would be really fantastic for museums to um, come together and come to start, start with some type of, of protocol of like, try to come to a, a, not a solution that will evolve everything, because that's never going to happen, but at least like, uh, try to attempt to draw a path that we can look at and benefit from other people's mistakes. I don't want to be the six millionth person committing the same mistake. Um, I want to learn from the stories of other galleries and museums so that we, we, we approach this together. Um, and I don't even know where, honestly, I don't even know where to start. I'm all for restitution. Seven million pieces at a few hundred thousand each? I mean, you're, you're in the dozens of billions. That's okay. That's yeah. That's what Sotheby's does in a year, right? So, okay. Uh, one other thing is just about that is often we look at this as a loss, right? Or a threat. And my lived experience on restitution is actually amazingly beautiful stuff happens and surprising stuff. In Honolulu, we had a, a totem pole from, from Alaska 
stolen by John Barrymore, Drew Barrymore's grandfather, given to Vincent Price, who gave it to his widow, who gave it to us. Thanks, right? Um, it was the clearest case of a stolen funerary totem pole I've ever seen. Um, got a letter from a lawyer, called Alaska Airlines, said, hey, let's bring out people from this community. It's the only 19th century object surviving in this community. We gave it back. Their carving tradition got down to one carver, and they're now built up to 16, right? So there's a lot of pride. And within the ethics of their community, um, they couldn't take something, even though it was legally, morally, ethically there. So they, when they arrived, they arrived with unbelievable carvings. To, to fill the hole. That is like, that's the kind of story that emerges. And often this is like seen in this like really confrontational way. And the reality, that's not my experience in reality. If you open with, you enter in a listening a little bit. Thanks so much. I think we're, we're at time, um, but I think that's a wonderful place to be thinking about uh, the future of collecting and where it should be uh, moving forward. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Take care.